If we look up to Leicester here at the end of Gallatry Gate, we can see a clock on what's called central buildings. And the date, if you can make it out, it says 1887. And of course, was the first of the Queen's Jubilees. And to mark that Jubilee, rather in the same way we're trying to find ways of marking the millennium and building funny domes and so forth, the Victorians decided to have a new entrance to the marketplace. Because you can see the market beyond us with this rather nice ironwork sculpture declaring Leicester Market. And beyond that, the Corn Exchange. But until 1887, this would have been just a solid wall of shops and houses. If you wanted to get to the market from Gallatry Gate, you had to go right up to the clock tower and east gates, or you had to go up Horse Fair Street into the back of the market by the Saracen's Head. Oh, it's called Molly O'Grady's now, isn't it? Well, so this, this was rather inconvenient, especially if you were a visitor to Leicester and you wanted to get to the Corn Exchange from, say, the station. To avoid that long journey, uh, they put in a new entrance here to the market. If we turn the other way, we can see the NatWest Bank. Uh, that was built in 1867 as uh, one of the, 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 the new banks of the town by somebody called Millican. Now, Mr. Millican, William Millican, was the leader of the Tories on the town council, as it happened. And he also, he also designed, and, uh, designed as the architect of the fish market, uh, which is alongside the, the old corn exchange. Uh, from this point, of course, we can look back and br briefly glimpse the clock tower. And uh, if we go into the marketplace, we can look at the facade of Gallatry Gate at the back, because when the whole of Gallatry Gate was felled in, 19, in the 1960s, the back of it was kept. So we still have the marketplace looking as it did in Victorian times. And the Corn Exchange certainly repays close attention. If we look at those famous steps, we can see, we can see that they, are, they have the initials of the architect, a man called Audish. And if you look underneath the steps, you see FWO, FW Audish. He, in fact, built the steps and the top story to the Corn Exchange. The bottom floor was built five years earlier, in 1851, by William Flint. And this corn exchange was exactly what it says, a corn exchange somewhere where farmers uh, could deal with uh, corn uh, merchants and sell their wares, various products. It was built in 1851 because in the previous year, the old corn exchange had been knocked down. That had been uh, there for many years, in fact, for about 100 years, and it was not only a corn exchange, but a place where prisoners were kept, a place where the magistrates met, and all sorts of public functions held. But the new corn exchange put up in uh, 1851, and then added to by Audish in 1851, shows us what it was built for. If you look closely at the, uh, at the top of the building, you'll see sheaves of corn, and uh, you'll see other uh, symbols of this agricultural purpose. And this, I'm glad to say, has been recently, very recently restored and is now a thriving uh, cafe bar. And you can go and uh, drink and eat there. And it's, it's lovely to see the centerpiece of the market living again. Uh, in front is the statue of the Duke of Rutland, who was Lord Lieutenant of the county for about 50 years. And of course, the market itself was here, has been here for about 700 years. It's the oldest open marketplace in the country. And then if we go through one of the uh, snickets by the jitties, whatever you call them, uh, by the old fish market put up, as I say, by William Flint, uh, Millican in uh, 1877, uh, if we go through the uh, jitty into Town Hall Square, we can see there uh, some of the buildings around the edge of the old Town Hall Square. Let's do that. As we move into Town Hall Square from the marketplace, we pass where the Woolwich Building Society is now, where Sarsen's Wine Shop used to be. And this is interesting because many of you will recognise Pauline's in St Martin's, the St Martin's Shopping Centre. And it's just opposite the Ark. 
and the frontage of Pauline's used to be here in the marketplace. Uh, it's a piece of uh, wooden carving uh, and we're not sure how old it is but certainly a couple of hundred years old. Rather interesting that it's been saved in this way and relocated. Now in the market in Town Hall Square itself if we look at Horse Fair Street there are some interesting buildings here. There used to be many more interesting buildings until they were pulled down. But we still have the Sun Alliance building. This is a building by Goddard, the man who designed the clock tower. And it's a very fine piece of uh, work. Again, just the facade. The back was uh, altered and pulled down in the 1970s. But uh, a beautiful piece of uh, mixture of styles, sort of Renaissance and uh, Dutch and uh, Elizabethan, but the workmanship is superb. The brickwork and stone uh, is, is beautifully done. It was the Sun Alliance building uh, of 1891. Further along is the Royal Hotel, and the Royal Hotel is uh, in fact designed by two different architects. Uh, Thomas Barnard did the the main part with uh, the uh, higher part and um, that is Horse Fair Street. Horse Fair Street was so named because this is where the Horse Fair was held. In fact Town Hall Square, the whole of this area, used to be the cattle market and here you would find sheep and cows and pigs all manner of animals sold until 1872 when they were cleared away and the new cattle market was opened on Welford Road, the corner of Aylston Road, where it was until recently. And of course the cattle market brought a great deal of trade to the town. Uh, people came here and went to the pubs for refreshment and so many of the uh, business people here didn't want the cattle market to be moved. But um, it was moved partly because the Midland Railway had already uh, built a special siding to the new cattle market in 1866 as a result of an Act of Parliament of 1866. So the council were obliged. They had no choice. They had to build a new town hall here. Otherwise, they would have had to pay the Midland Railway a lot of money in compensation. Um, the word horse fair, of course, as I say, because the horses also were were sold here and it's all outside the town. The town walls used to run along that side of uh, Horse Fair Street and then along Gallery Gate to the clock tower and down Church Gate. So that was the Roman town, the medieval town and we're standing now outside the old town uh, in uh, the fields that lay beyond it. Well, uh, after the town hall was built in 1876 uh, the space in front was laid out as a garden and uh, we have the fountain here uh, designed by the same architect that did the town hall, John Francis Hames, and uh, it's very attractive. It's one of the most popular places in Leicester for people to enjoy the open air. And if we look beyond it, we can see the back of some banks, uh, Leicester Promotions, uh, and then on one side on the left is the Barclays Bank, designed by Alfred Sorday in about uh, 1891 and uh, Richard Gill uh, says that the ladies over the door of the bank uh, look as if they beyond, belong to a profession even older than banking. I think you can see what he means. At the other end of that side of Town Hall Square, it's Every Street by the way, or Every Street, many people will know the old uh, story, I don't know whether it's true that it's uh, the, the taxi cabs in, in Leicester, used, the cabbies used to say both that they knew every street in Leicester because this is where the ta taxi cabs used to stand. Um, the other end is, is the back of the Midland Bank designed again by Goddard, the man that did the clock tower and the Sun Alliance building and it's in a very different style from the first bank that we saw. You remember the William Millikan's bank on the corner of Horse Fair Street and uh, Granby Street that was designed by uh, Millikan in a very simple, classical style, uh, Italianate perhaps. But the Midland Bank 
designed by Goddard, very, very different. It was the very latest in Victorian architecture, a mixture of French Renaissance, Gothic, wonderful workmanship, the carving by Samuel Barfield, who again did the work on the, the clock tower, and all the detail in it is, is beautifully executed. Then if we turn to the other side of Town Hall Square, to the uh, Methodist Chapel, this was built in 1815, as you can see if you look at the top there, designed in fact by the minister, the Reverend Jenkins. And uh, it is a beautiful building, classical, splendidly simple in its design, and certainly one of the best loved buildings in Leicester. To the left, there is a little uh, Sunday school building, and then next to that, a small building by Arthur Wakerley, uh, which is the solicitor's office. And next to that is the rather splendid building, uh, the Liberal Club. Now, the Liberal Club was, of course, the place where the Liberals met. Liberals were the dominant party in Leicester in the 19th century. From 1836 until 1909, they had a majority on the town council, sort of thing that would have quite pleased Paddy Ashdown. And, of course, they wanted a splendid building in which they could meet. And this was designed for them by one of their number, Edward Burgess. Edward Burgess did many other buildings in Leicester, including the, the uh, reference library at the other end, the other side of uh, the Wesleyan Chapel. But uh, here the Liberals met and of course they could, some of them would be not only members of the Liberal Club but also members of the corporation, the town council, and uh, it was a very convenient place. If we then look at the town hall itself, this is a very special building indeed. It was designed by John Francis Hames, who was a Leicester architect, and it is the first public building to be designed in this so-called Queen Anne style. It is not Victorian, it's not Victorian Gothic, it is not classical, it's an entirely new, known as Queen Anne because of its uh, architectural features, the uh, very large window panes, the uh, large areas of brick and of stone mixed together. Um, if we look at the detail, we can see uh, some uh, interesting carving on the chimneys, uh, the sunflower motif, uh, the top story windows, uh, very attractive. And over the ground floor uh, windows to the right of the town hall entrance, uh, some very interesting carving. Again, uh, I'm not sure who the architect or the designer was, I don't think it's known. But uh, if we look at it closely, it's a, uh, night and day. And it's worth looking in, in, in detail at this. You can see the symbols of night, the moon, the owl, the flowers of the night, and day with uh, sunflowers and the sun itself, and birds and flowers in bloom. By the mid-19th century, the old town hall was considered much too cramped and out of date for council meetings, and the council has met for a short while in the museum at New Walk. When this building was complete, the first resolution of the council was that the new building should be known as the Town Hall of Leicester, because in fact it never contained a large public meeting room or town hall. The reason for this was pure economy. The councillors didn't want to waste money on a grand hall when there were already several public halls available, such as Thomas Cook's Temperance Hall, that, alas, was demolished in the 1950s. Uh, the Liberals, the local Liberals, naturally hoped that William Gladstone would come and open the new building. But Gladstone let this great opportunity to encourage his supporters in Leicester slip with characteristic long-windedness. The Mayor, Alderman Barfoot, had to report that the result of three quarters of an hour conversation with the great liberal statesman 
was that pressure of work prevented his coming. Now finally, it's interesting to note that if you look up to Leicester at this point, the town hall appears to have been built from top down, because the date on the gable says 1875, and the one at the bottom says 1876. Now you can find lots more information about Victorian Leicester in this, this little book by Richard Gill. It's published by the Victorian Society and is available for £2.50 from the tourist office or from most bookshops. Or you could send £3 to cover the cost of postage and packing to our publication secretary, John Goodall. Here's his address. Mm -hmm.